Okay, so now let's get started and meet your speakers today. Bill Sloan is an Associate Director of Mechanical and Electrical Services for the Commonwealth of Kentucky's Division of Engineering and Contract Administration. Bill has been with the Commonwealth for 20 years, overseeing the design and construction of state capital projects. Prior to his career with the Commonwealth, Bill was a consulting engineer for the design of building mechanical systems. He earned a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from the University of Kentucky. Chris Anderson is vice president of data strategy and consulting for RS Means from the Gordian Group, and he is responsible for overseeing all data aspects of the construction lifecycle from conception through build and facility operations to create a world-class data platform, including predictive analytics. Prior to joining the Gordian Group, Chris was head of technology, general manager for RS Means. He has also served as VP of product for integrated broadband services. And your third speaker today is Philip Ware. He is Principal Engineer Emeritus with the Gordian Group. He holds an MS in Civil Engineering from Villanova University and a BS in, BA in Science from the University of Windsor. He is a registered professional engineer in Massachusetts and Rhode Island. As Principal Engineer for RS Means, he set up and managed custom cost databases for numerous government agencies and provided seminars and custom training for commercial and government organizations. He has also consulted on the implementation of indefinite delivery order contracts. Phil is an expert witness in appraisal litigation and class action suits involving commercial and residential building products. So without further ado, I will hand it over to your first speaker, Bill Sloan. Welcome, Bill. My name is Bill Sloan. I'm Associate Director for Mechanical and Electrical Services for the Commonwealth of Kentucky, the Division of Engineering and Contract Administration. Our agency handles the administration of design and construction of capital construction projects for many of the Kentucky state agencies. I'm also the current president of NASFA, NASFA, National Association for State Facilities Administrators. NASFA is a national organization for all uh, state facilities administrators are eligible to join and the idea is to facilitate the exchange of the information regarding uh, the operation and maintenance and construction of facilities. Uh, we have a website nasfa.net and uh, you can go to the nasfa.net and get a lot of information on what we do, what, uh, for, uh, what kind of programs are available. That's what we're here for to share ideas and information. Sometimes you find that, well, everybody's in the same boat and uh, we all face the same problems. And one of the problems that we face in uh, state government or public procurement is we have to balance, one, we have to balance uh, the available money with what our goals of the project are in public procurement. When we're working with state agencies, uh, we review their budget requests and I don't know whether most states are but we have to work backwards from a fixed budget typically. Uh, budget is developed by someone at the agency and gets approved in the budget and then we have to take that figure and make it work for what they want for the project and the key to that is you have to have good information to develop that budget. Unfortunately what we see is sometimes agencies come to us with a budget that they really don't know how it was developed. It may have been something informally on the back of an envelope eight years ago. It's been in the budget request every time since then and hasn't been funded until now and then we find ourselves with an out-of-date budget that maybe wasn't all that well prepared to begin with. So the key is um, getting a chance to review that budget before it's established and make sure it's realistic and when we have an opportunity to do that we we try to use historical data where we use, uh, we've done a recent project that's very similar in nature. We'll certainly use published data like RS means um, that's available. And then we'll also work with local contractors and suppliers to keep on top of trends. Um, right now we're seeing bid prices come in higher than we expected and we have to adjust for that. So any future projects that are under design right now are, are really uh, having a close look at their budget to make sure we, we can reflect those trends. Sometimes uh, the agency who comes up with the original budget will question why we think that's inadequate and we sit down with them and say okay uh, here's historically what we've seen and here's why we think that you know you need to add 20 percent to this project or I'm using that as an example but uh, we do have to explain to them why we think their numbers uh, are different than ours. Uh, the problem comes is 
once you come up with a solution that exceeds your capital budget, whether or not that's a good idea, um, becomes moot if you don't have enough money to take care of a, a, a scenario that involves more capital expenditure than what you've got. So I think it's very important for states to uh, have audits of their facilities and, and plan for their deferred maintenance. And having that assessment uh, is a great tool because you can, um, first of all, you can get a handle on what uh, the magnitude of your problem is. It's probably going to be a little depressing because you know you're not going to have enough money to take care of everything, but then you can prioritize. One of the examples I can point to in Kentucky is over the last 15 years, we have purchased probably 75 large centrifugal water chillers for air conditioning. And chillers are a little bit like an iceberg. What you see is above the water. And that represents a small fraction of the total mass of the iceberg. The bulk of the iceberg is below the water that you don't see. And cost of ownership for something like a chiller, for example, is a lot like the iceberg. There is the visible part, uh, what you pay for the chiller to get it installed. But below the water surface represents the maintenance and over the course of the life of the chiller, that can be many times what the initial purchase price was. So I think the key in using life cycle cost is to think about it ahead of time before the budgets are developed and make sure you have a realistic budget that will give you some latitude to make those kind of decisions. But that was an example of where the life cycle costing did come into the decision making, but you really need good data to to apply those numbers. If you know what it costs to maintain a water source heat pump system or a chill water system, a VAV system or whatever, then you can plug those numbers in. And if you have access to those from a third party, for example, uh, that is a good source that you can use for that. So it's a great tool to take your needs and match them up with your money and, and make sure you spend the money in the, in the most uh, expeditiously responsible uh, method. And that's part of the trick of, of balancing what's available to what needs to be done. And if you don't have a plan, you can't really make good decisions on on where to put that money that you do have allocated. Sometimes things sound like they would be worth it, but when you really run the numbers, it's a real eye-opener that, wow, I didn't realize that we were going to be costing our, ourselves this much over, say, 20, 25 years life of the equipment. And so if you can incorporate things other than the price, uh, you know, using life cycle costing, uh, that's certainly one of the components that goes into it. So just to wrap up a little bit about what we've been talking about, I think all it's safe to say that all the states face challenges from budgets. There's never enough money to go around for all the capital needs. And so it's important that you have facilities assessment. Uh, it's important that you establish priorities for what you want to do with the available money. Uh, you need, on the assessment, you need to develop good numbers for your budget, for the, the projects that you are able to fund. And life cycle costing can be an important part of that to make sure that you are good stewards of those, that, that money and that you use the money wisely. My name is Phil Weir, and uh, we're going to be talking about facility assessment, budgeting, and life cycle costing. So we're going to be starting off with a facilities manager's goal, and that is uh, essentially to proactively manage the growing list of maintenance needs. And uh, what are those maintenance needs? Well, we're going to be talking about uh, capital renewal, the replacement of the boiler, the heat exchanger, the preventive maintenance, and repair maintenance. And then somewhat the uh, maybe the elephant in the room or not the elephant in the room is the deferred maintenance that we might have at our facilities, which includes all of the above. A deferred maintenance can include capital renewal, can, re can include preventive maintenance, and it can include repair maintenance. Well, I've got three steps. You can choose your own option, uh, one of which is a conduct a facilities condition audit. Uh, and I know in the U.S. agencies, uh, many of them are required to, on a periodic basis, uh, do a condition assessment audit, uh, sometimes on a three- to five-year basis. 
Another option might be parametric modeling, and that's one thing we're going to be talking, or I'm going to be talking about as well. And then the third option to creating this is your own building knowledge, which includes your knowledge of the strengths of your building or the weaknesses of your building. Plus, I'm quite certain that you have a maintenance backlog that you can look at to also give you some idea of what you need to address. So in terms of an assessment, uh, if we talk about a facilities audit, what we want to do is we want to have a thorough understanding of the equipment and the systems in our building or buildings. And that's a very important thing because that's how we're going to then start to establish our budgets. So what happens in terms of doing the facilities audit, we've got to determine what we want to uh, be doing an audit of. And are we going to be just doing buildings or are we going to be including grounds, utilities, and equipment? I have to admit, for the most part, I usually see it just the buildings, but of course, if you've got a central plant or something of that nature, uh, you surely might want to get into uh, the utilities. Equipment, depending upon what equipment we have, how critical it is, uh, we might also include that. So what in terms of doing the, uh, the audit, what are, what, are, what are we looking for? What do we want to get out of it? And one of them is uh, if we've got uh, numerous buildings at our campus, maybe we want to create a condition index. I don't know how many of you have ever done that. Actually, a condition index uh, is basically telling us the condition of our building, and it is a calculation that is the numerator we have deferred maintenance the value of deferred maintenance, the cost of it, and in the uh, denominator we have the current replacement value of the building itself. So we might want to do a facility condition index. The other thing we want to do is if we do the audit, we could define regular maintenance requirements. So here we have a list of all the equipment that we've got in the building, so we can define the maintenance required. We also know the uh, contents of the building, so we can define the capital repair and replacements, Another thing we can do is we can then, as a result of that, we can develop cost estimates for the projects, for our deferred maintenance, or if we're putting together a life cycle budgeting program, we can define the preventive maintenance, the maintenance and repair, and the replacement. Finally, it's going to uh, eliminate potentially hazardous conditions. As a result of the audit, we can identify hazardous conditions and also we could possibly identify some energy conservation measures. The audit process, though, is essentially three parts. Designing the audit, collecting the data, and then probably the most important aspect of that is the presentation of the findings. So when we talk about designing the audit, as I indicated before, we have to decide, well, gee, what do we want to audit? Do we want to audit just the buildings, or do we want to go on to the grounds and utilities, and what about the equipment? And then the depth of the audit. At the bottom here, you'll see that we talk about a comprehensive audit and a condensed audit. I usually refer to the condensed audit as possibly a white glove type audit, whereas a comprehensive audit is we are potentially going to be going in and, uh, for instance, we've got a panel board we might pull off the front of the panel board and do an infrared inspection of that panel board to see if we've got any heat building up in our connections. We might also do infrared inspection of a roof or something like that. But uh, depending upon going above the, the depth of the audit, well, we decide, well, what are the needs? Uh, what is the cost of the audit and what time do we have? So obviously the, the cost and time might determine whether we're doing a comprehensive audit or a condensed audit. The next thing is selecting the audit team. And we've got three options here in terms of using our in-house staff, an interagency group, or some consultants. But regardless of which path we take, essentially what your, your audit team is usually composed of about three or four people. And usually in that audit team, you have a, uh, a mechanical type person, an electrical type person, and then an architectural slash maybe structural type person. Next step, okay, is designing the work plan. What information are we going to collect? Uh, who will collect the information and the schedule? And probably a schedule is one of the most important things also because, well, U.S. facilities managers know that there are so many 
things coming at you that unfortunately with all those things you sometimes one thing has to suffer as a result of another. So uh, to keep us going we need a schedule. Again when we start to collect our data are we the physical data we could have talked about primary systems, secondary systems, service, safety, and then again whether we're going to go grounds uh, equipment and utilities and then last but not least in this uh, gathering process we want to do a physical evaluation of the building, a functional performance evaluation, a facility rating. Maybe we are going to use a facilities condition index for our buildings, especially if we've got a number of them. A project cost evaluation. And then finally, setting our priorities. Again, this last one, the presentation of findings, is probably one of the most important. And what we're going to be doing here is, in the first step, we're talking about summarizing our building characteristics, how many square feet, what the, the cooling system, the heating system, uh, electrical uh, requirements, a uh, building evaluation. And then what we're going to do next is we're going to be setting priorities. We've, if we've done an uh, assessment, we're going to see things that need to be addressed, and then we're going to have to prioritize them. Looking at the bottom here, the work categories, or actually, the, as far as I'm concerned, it's priorities, emergency, urgent, routine, or deferred. And then what happens is, again, the most important thing is presenting the findings. You've got to recognize who your audience is. And probably, if you're going to present the findings, you might present them in several layers. Obviously, you're the vice president of facilities or something like that is interested in a very, very detailed thing. The more you move up the ladder in the, core, in the organization, the person doesn't want to read a 500-page report or maybe a 20-page report. So you've really got to define who your audience is and direct that report to them. So the results of the audit. The results of the audit allows us to estimate the costs of the deficiencies that we've uh, identified. It allows us to estimate the costs of the efficiencies I've, we've identified. But as a result of the audit, we know all of the uh, equipment that we have in the building. We know the characteristics of the building. So we can then go about and we can estimate the preventive maintenance that we should be spending on the building. We know in the building, we should also be able to estimate the amount of uh, capital replacement that we need for that building. And also, as a result of the audit, we can plan for cyclical replacement of the carpet, the painting, things of that nature, and thus actually create a life cycle cost maintenance budget for the building or buildings. And uh, again, this data can be used to calculate a facilities condition index. So in terms of deferred maintenance priorities, this is the, I'll use the expression, the prioritization structure that I would use. The first one is life safety, legal compliance. What are the new codes that I should be living up to? In the Boston area, there are relatively new standards relative to uh, fire alarm systems, carbon dioxide, things of that nature. Next one is, is, is the problem that I've identified resulting in the deterioration to facilities. Or the next one is repairs to prevent deterioration. And the last one, even though I'm not certain, the last one should be energy conservation. But uh, anyway, that would, be, uh, that would be the potential fifth one. I, let's put it this way. I, the reason why I said it that way is because energy conservation, as far as I'm concerned, is very important. And I hate to necessarily put it at the bottom of the list. OK, in terms of budgeting, well, we know our equipment. Uh, we know what the major characteristics of the building are. So how do we start budgeting? And again, there's a lot of different data. Budgeting can be accomplished using several different options, uh, one of which is the, the owner's current data. That's always a, a good option. Uh, maybe uh, recently you've replaced a chiller or you've replaced a, a boiler in a building you know how much it costs and you can use that for another building vendor information sure you can call vendors and find out uh, the cost of different data or different uh, materials or equipment of course the other thing is call contractors in and the last thing which is um, which is of course my specialty which happens to be published cost data Okay, now let's talk about life cycle costing. So what happens is we know how we know we can estimate capital renewal. 
we know we can estimate preventive maintenance. We know that there's data out there to uh, put together some repair maintenance and cyclical replacements. And uh, now let's talk about life cycle costing. Uh, life cycle costing are based upon the type of structure. Is it an outpatient surgical center or is it a hotel? Also, the type of structure. Is it wood frame structure? Is it EIFS uh, on concrete block? And then what equipment is located in the building? So what happens is our definition, the definition that I'm going to be using for this presentation is uh, an economic method of evaluating a project's preventive maintenance, repair maintenance, and capital renewal costs. These costs are added annually over the life of a project for a specific time frame. And I wanted to point out that this is not total cost of ownership. All we're talking about here is the building and the components of that building. We're not talking about energy usage and other costs of that nature. So four important questions. What is the annual preventive maintenance cost for our building? What is the cost of capital improvements? Now, mind you, capital improvements are not necessarily something that are going to occur annually. You're going to replace a boiler every 30 years. You're going to replace a roof every 25 years. You might replace a hot water heater every 15 years. There are some years when you might not have any capital improvements. However, there are some years when you might take a real hit in having to replace a, a, a heat exchanger or something of that nature. And then what is the cost of repair, maintenance, slash cyclical replacement? And maybe what you want to do is what is the facilities condition index of the building? What happens is the facilities condition index of the building, it allows you to do two things. It allows you to compare building A with building B with building C. But the other thing it allows you to do is if you do this on a periodic basis, you can say, well, I've got building A. And in year 2015, I had a facilities condition index of uh, 0.15. 0.15 is reasonably high. That's saying that 15% of the replacement value of the building is tied up in deferred maintenance. But maybe what you're going to want to do is say, OK, in 2015, I have a 0.15. But what I want to do is by the time I get to the year 2020, I want to have that facilities condition index if I'm going to be doing another audit or a, even a white glove audit, down to something like 0.10 or 0.12. In other words, I want to be pecking away at that deferred maintenance. Hi, thank you for joining us. My name is Chris Anderson. I'm the Vice President of Data Strategy and uh, Consulting at RS Means from the Guardian Group. I'd like to thank Phil Ware for his outline there of facilities management. I've been asked to run through our new online version of lifecycle costing. This is a very powerful tool for facility managers. It allows you to take one of our square foot models of a building and be able to understand in great detail the work involved in doing facility work across that building's life cycle. So to show you an example on the screen now, we've selected a building type. In this case, it's an office building of 11 to 20 stories in height. Um, it has a brick face and concrete block backup. You can select anything from uh, 100 plus models and a number of different types of framing and other different parameters that can be selected. Additionally, you can then add in locations, sizing, etc. that allows you to tailor these models to your specific building types. And you can see from there the build cost of that building, and then you can calculate the facility maintenance and repair costs over its life cycle. 
So as we move along, you can see here when we take that building and we run it through our lifecycle cost estimator, it allows you to see the various types of facility maintenance and repair work that will be undertaken. This is from our standardized library against those building types. They can be customized to your individual buildings and individual configuration of the items within that building. You can then use this to understand and complete your budget in terms of maintenance and repair and preventative maintenance tasks over time. If we look at the next slide here, you can see by year the costs that will be used in preventative maintenance as well as maintenance and repair to understand a total annualized budget for that individual building. This will allow you to uh, use this on a case-by-case -case basis to complete a costing for your entire portfolio of buildings. You can then pull together a summary table of all of those costs and be able to see in a graphical form your costs over years. This is critical for helping you understand where you have large jumps in your budgeting and be able to justify those budget changes to the uh, committees in your various facilities to be able to understand why you have uh, large change years and exactly have detailed analytical data to back up those changes in the cost. Thank you for joining us today on this webinar. As you can see on the screen, there's a URL for you to go to for a full demonstration of lifecycle costing. I will be available to answer any questions that you may have during our live Q&A session. All right, we're going to move on to our polling question. You'll see on your screen, what type of cost data do you currently use for budgeting and estimating? Published cost data, your own data, subcontractor data, city or public record data, or previous projects. All right, it looks like the results are in, and um, most of you are using previous projects uh, followed closely by published cost data to find um, currently used for your budgeting and estimating. So thank you very much for sharing that. Um, now we're going to move in into um, the question and answer section of the webinar. Uh, and my name is Nicole Benke. I work with uh, the Gordian Group, and we'll be facilitating this portion of the uh, live webinar. Um, so if you haven't already, please go ahead and submit your questions, um, and we'll get our, our speakers to answer those. Again, uh, if you see on the screen, if you want a more detailed demo uh, than what Chris Anderson went through today, which was a very broad-based top of uh, 